Good afternoon. Good afternoon, John. This is uh, February 22nd, 1999. We're here in Natick, Massachusetts. This is the part of the North Morris Institute Library Continuing Veterans Oral History Project. And may I ask, what is your name, sir? My name is John Crisofoli. Crisofoli. John, for the uh, benefit of historians to come, would you spell your last name, please? Yes, I would. C-R-I-S-A-F-U-L-L-I, -L -L and it's pronounced Chris, Chrisafoli. Chrisafoli. The way it's spelled, Chris, C-R-I-S-A-F-U-L-L-I, -L -L Chrisafoli. All right, thank you, John. What is your address, please? Natick. And your current marital status? I'm married with uh, five children and six grandchildren. Wow, <laughs> that's great. May I ask your age? Uh, 67. 67. Where were you born, John? Right here in Natick. In right. Natick. Matter of fact, I was born in the home I grew up in. Uh, is that right? Yes, on 9 Cross Street, which is about two streets away from where I live. So you are a genuine townie. Yes, I am. You were a Natick native. Um, what was Natick like when you grew up here? Well, going back to when I can remember, not when I was born, but you know, growing up, Natick, I think the population, like when I was in junior high school, was probably around 16 or 17,000 people. Uh, Natick was, uh, you know, where most of the people that lived here, they sort of knew everyone. Mm -hmm. before the town really started to grow and develop. A, a kind of small town atmosphere. Absolutely. Regardless of the size of the right. place. Um, what was your family background here? What did your dad do and your mom do here? Well, I'm the youngest of nine children. My father and mother came from Italy, Sicily really. My father was born in Palermo and my mother was born in Messina. Neither one of them had any schooling. My father was a laborer. My mother worked in the uh, old ball shop factory here that's really? no longer yeah. um, producing baseballs and softballs, the Howard ball shop. That's correct. Yeah, yeah. she worked there for years sewing. I'd like to think that maybe one, a few of her baseballs were Used in the major leagues, I don't know. But it's it's entirely possible. Yeah. Did you your uh, do you remember walking around this town as a smaller town without without traffic and not oh. so much as it is today? Well, maybe I don't, I don't know if you, you're from around this area, John, but I know down in down t right in the common there used to be a, a drinking fountain right there where. Uh, where right the at the corner of the common, yeah, yes. where the police booth used to be. Um, the main street, uh, of course, we had all the, we had the AMP, First National, Stop and Shop. We had Dorothy Muriel's, um, uh, Jones's Drugstore, I think, moved three times. Mm -hmm. Used to be over where the, I think it started where the American Legion, then it went to the corner uh, where the jewelry store used to be. Jones's was there for a long period, mm -hmm. and then it moved to its <coughs> present, present place. Uh, Stop and Shop used to be where Town Paint is, uh, and of course uh, where Taylor Rental, there used to be a, a block of uh, small stores there. Um, yeah, the place has changed, but. It has. Sure. So you went through grammar school? Uh, and then you went to the high school? Went to all the schools here in Natick. Yeah. Upon graduation, 1950, in June, I was undecided whether to go to college or not. So I, at that time, a few of my friends, prior to my grad, they were a year ahead of me, joined the Marine, Marine Corps. So I joined the Marine Corps. And of course, that was the beginning of the Korean War shortly after I joined. Now, had you, had you graduated from high school? I graduated from high school. A class of what, 1950? 1950. I graduated that June of 50. Mm -hmm. 
And I went into the uh, <coughs> Marine Corps. Well, you you had you had been too young for World War Two. Yes. And so 1950 comes along. What was Natick like at a time when there was another war? Some place well, in, in it was a just place called Korea. Then, actually, prior to 1950, John, there, you know, the Korean War hadn't. It started. I don't know exactly the date that it started, but it, when I first joined, as a matter of fact, uh, I joined in August um, of, of 50, 1950. And when I first joined, I joined for four years, but then when I really, when I actually went in to get sworn in, um, I can remember the, um, I don't know what he was called, but the person in charge said, you have a choice now. You can join for four years, three years, or the duration of the Korean War. So at that time, I said, well, and I, have, I, I hadn't signed it, you know, actually being sworn in. Yeah. I said, well, the duration could last for several years. I had intended to join for four, but three somewhere in the middle is I took three. So I joined for three years and it worked out fine for me. Where did you enlist? In Boston. In Boston? Yeah. And you went in on the a streetcar one day and decided to be a Marine or had you thought about it bef beforehand? Uh, what no, service no. you would go into? Why did you become a Marine? Well, uh, World War II, uh, a neighbor of mine was in the Marines during World War II. And I had a, occasions to talk to him uh, many times uh, when he came home. And uh, my older, I had an older brother that was in the Navy. He went in the Navy in 1936 and stayed through the uh, war. Yeah. Um, so for some reason, I didn't want to join the Navy, maybe because my brother was in the Navy. But, but for some reason, I didn't want to be on a ship. You know, I want to, <laughs> my feet on the ground kind of thing. Um, I, I don't really know why, except that the Marine Corps had the mystique, you know, the yes, uh, a few good men. Semper Fi. Yeah, <laughs> Semper Fi. Why did you join the military? Was there a, a draft at that time, or you just enlisted? I, I no, I enlisted. I, I yeah. volunteered on my own. I, I I think the draft. I'm not sure if they. I think they did continue the draft uh, during that period, but. Uh, I didn't wait for that. Okay, so and how old, are, how old were you at this time? 18. Then? 18, right, fresh out of high school. That's correct. Did friends or family join the uh, service at the time you did, or were you no, I went in. I, no, I went in by myself. I'm sure that others joined, but no one came with me when I, uh, I joined okay. by myself. Right. Okay, so you signed the papers in Boston, That's and right. then what happened to you? Well, uh, <laughs> that was an experience, right? In a, I don't know what your experience was when you joined the Marine Corps, but they must have had it down pat because we took a train. And of course, I met all the others that joined from different communities. Yes. And we, and they put us on the train, and we, uh, to. We're going to Paris Island. We got off. I don't know the name of the town where the train stopped to get on buses. But I can remember the DI. Of course, we were in civilian clothes then, because we weren't at. <laughs> he said, "Get off this blank train!" And people, and he didn't care how you get out. People would jump out the windows, out the, out the door. Your first <laughs> encounter with the DI. <laughs> yeah, but I, but see, <clears throat> I, I had a slight advantage in the sense that I mentioned to you, John. I talked to my neighbor who was in the Marine Corps. And so he, he tipped me off, not on a lot of things, but about some of the drilling and kind of thing. So I you kind had of some knowledge about it. So, yes. you know, but I still jumped off the train oh, like yeah. everybody else. Because that, that might have been Port Royal or Yamasee, and then you went over to Paris Island. That's correct, on the bus. What was your impression? Now, you're a, a kid right out of, <laughs> coming out of Natick, Massachusetts. Yeah. What was your impression of, of that first day there? Well, uh, you, well, it was sort of not scary, but you know, 
different. <laughs> How about terrifying? <laughs> and the other funny thing, of course, when you get to Paris Island, when you go through the hygienic unit and they shave your head and give you clothes, and I can remember after going through, um, you think you know every, you know, you meet a few friends going down on the train, so. But it was funny, when we came out, <laughs> They looked different. I couldn't, you know, and I they couldn't recognize some of them. It was awful funny because uh, you, you see them with a, a lot of them had hair and all combed and everything. And then, and then, of course, when you line up after you have your head shaved, <laughs> they all look different. They all look like plucked chickens. Oh, wow, yeah. And it was hard, really, to recognize them. I mean, you really had to look to see if your friend was still the same person. Yeah without his hair. You said you uh, had some friends <clears throat> go down on the train with you. Uh, did you see them at PI when you were there? Were they in the same platoon with you? Well, the one that I really remember was Tony DeMarco from South Boston, and we ended up in the same platoon. And we stayed, we stayed together until we, well, we even went overseas together, but we sort of got in different units when we mm -hmm. went overseas. But uh, Did you make any other uh, good friends at PI, people that you uh, were in your squad or platoon? Well, you're, n not, not lifelong friends, but friends at the time. Mm -hmm. but, uh, of course, when you leave boot camp, um, the only one that really st um, stayed with me or we stayed together was Tony DeMarco. Tony DeMarco. Yeah. Now this is somebody you knew from here, or no? I met you met in him Boston. at PI. Yeah. At, Bo at Boston. Yeah. And how long were you at Paris Island? I think it was about twelve weeks. I, I know it wasn't long because the Korean. See, the Chinese then came into the Korean War, so I don't know if they. I didn't know this. I don't know if they sped their training up or not, but mm -hmm. it didn't seem like we were there. Let's say we went in there in August, August, uh, September. I think I came home in October. You got a furlough after got, boot camp? Yeah, yeah they yeah. let us home for like a week. And from boot camp, um, depending where you were sent, I was sent to Camp Lejeune. So you training. went to the Fleet Marine Force and right after Paris Germany. Island. Okay. And then, uh, well, I went in in August, and I was on my way in December <laughs> to Korea. Okay. Now, when you, after you left Natick, you came home, you were in your greens or khakis or yeah. if it was summertime. Yeah. Um, well, it was did you know you were going I, down to uh, Lejeune? Had, did you know you were going to Lejeune? You oh had yes. Been assigned there already. Yes. Yeah. yeah. So you knew you were going into the infantry. Yes. Okay. Well, did you have a specialty? Uh, were you a rifleman, a mortar man? Uh, what was no? What at were you Camp Lejeune, we learned a lot, but mostly uh, the concentration that the unit that I was with was uh, water water cool sub uh, machine gun. A fifty caliber. No. Thirty. Thirty-two. Thirty. Okay. 30 caliber, I'm sorry. Okay, and so you learned to field strip it and do all the all mechanical that. things. Yeah. Okay. Are you, were you part of a unit such as a squad, or what was the size of the group of people you were with? In, in Camp Lejeune? Yes. Oh, the whole barracks. I, I, you know, number wise, 70s. 72 75, men. 72. Yeah. Something like that. Okay. And within that group, there were, you know, that was broken up into. Uh, smaller groups. Yeah. yeah. And I think you just said that you went overseas in December. Yep. So you got out of boot camp in October, and two months later you're on a boat. Or is that right? That's right. Okay. That was an experience that. So when, when, uh, don't yeah. rush. Yeah. How did you get from Lejeune to the West Coast? That's, that's just, just what I was going to tell you <laughs> okay. because they told us, of course, you're young, right? You're, well, I just turned 19, October is my birthday, so I turned 19 in October. And this was really my first experience away from home. 
Not mm -hmm. that we, I mean, I traveled yeah. a little bit with the family once in a while. My parents didn't have, couldn't drive, but I mean, it was real, my, my real first experience being away from home. But when we left Lejeune, they told us, we knew where we were going. This, uh, a, I think it was like 5,000 of us were going to Korea on a troop train. But they told us when we, and you probably know more than I, we're going to Treasure Island, San Francisco. Mm -hmm. and they said, when you get there, you'll have three days liberty, then you're going to go to Korea. So we all felt pretty good about that. So, But um, they put us on a troop train, and we went to Ned Stop every couple hours. You get out and stretch and exercise and get back on. We got to uh, California at the end, got off the train, and I'm thinking, uh, not just myself, but we get on these, uh, get on buses. We said, oh, we're going to take a bus to Treasure Island. I didn't know what Treasure Island was. And then the bus ride, we could, took us to the boat. We said, oh, we're going to take a boat because Treasure Island, had, we had to go. Of course, it was a troop ship. So we never got liberty. We went from the bus, all in one day, the train, the bus, the boat, and that morning we were gone. So you I should have put it all together when I saw the Red Cross there <laughs> handing out coffee and stuff. Did, <laughs> uh, did you go through that process of, um, what kind of process did you go through to get on the ship? Did you get a lecture? Did they talk to you about where you're going? I don't remember any lectures, John. Just. From a bus to from the, the ship. Bus to the ship. And how many of you were they were? Oh, the all ship probably four to five thousand. That's a lot of guys. Yeah. And um, did you know any? Well, of the, the ships, as you know, the, there was uh, the troop ship. The beds are stacked uh, from the floor to the ceiling. Must be, must be a eight or ten beds. Did you know anybody else on the ship? Were the, uh, was Tony with you on this? Tony was with me. And did you know anybody else on board? Not really, no. no. So your first duty station was North Carolina, and your second one was a bus train hop over to a ship and you were on your way. That's Do right. you remember the name of the ship? There are two ships, and I, I, I don't remember which one, the Derby, the US, the Derby and the Weagle. And you were on one of them? I was one, one going when the other one coming back. So you sailed out of San Francisco Bay, yep. under, under the bridge, Island. and took off. And did yeah. they tell you where you were going? Oh, we knew we were going to Korea. Straight to Korea? Yeah, we knew we didn't make any stops. It took us eight days. We did make one stop, and that was in Japan, and that was we didn't even stay there. We just to let either let somebody off or something. And okay. We didn't even stay. Stay and out. We didn't stay. We just just kept going. At that point, John, were you uh, in a particular division? No, I didn't. Not until I got to Korea. All right. So you were unassigned until you got to That's the, right. Korea. And when I got there, I was assigned to Weapons Company. 2nd Battalion, 5th Marines. 5th Marines? Regiment. All righty. And how about uh, the other men on the ship? Were they split up? Who knows? So you didn't see some of these guys after the boat stopped and you That's all right. got off. So where did you actually get off this ship? I don't know the place in Korea where I got off. Okay. And it, it took to me, it didn't make any difference. No, right? you were in Korea. Just, that's I was all in Korea that mattered. And just joined the group. And that's and it. Eight days. That seems eight like days. a pretty quick trip. It was. It took us 18 to come home. <laughs> oh, goodness. Now, at this point, you knew pretty well what you were going to be expert in. What you you still had carried the machine gun. That was your job. That's right. Did you have anybody working the gun with that, you? Well, the machine gun crew. I think there was seven or eight. Yeah, People somebody involved. handing you the ammo and, and uh, filling the water and all of that. Yeah. But I didn't do that very long. Too oh, long. It, what that. changed? When did it change? And well, I don't know when. Uh, let's see. 
cut the uh, chain wire. Probably sometime in the February. I don't know the exact date. John. That's okay. This loop. But when you unloaded, um, everybody, how, where did you go from there? Did, were you piled into trucks and taken somewhere? Yes. Were taken to, I was taken to weapons company wherever they were. Yeah. Uh, uh, stay, camped. Okay, you know. and then you said things changed. Yeah, a couple months later, uh, my Tony DeMarco was in a different group. I don't know what happened to him, but I bumped into him, and uh, they were starting this. This person that was in World War II was a raider, Marine raider. Carlson, Colonel Carlson. No, this was. He may have been in that group, but. Uh, this Lieutenant Holmes was his name, was starting a special forces group there, just volunteers. So I, and Tony DeMarco was in that group, got in that group before I did, well I didn't, he got in the group. So I volunteered to get in, but just because you volunteered didn't say you got in. <laughs> Would you describe a, what a special forces group is, uh, please? I can tell you now, but that bef while this was happening, I didn't know what their basic, what he, I guess he could freelance. Uh, uh, the main task was to harass the enemy. Uh, Were you then, uh, this group, was it assigned to a division? First Marine Division. You were then in the First Marine Division, the best of the best. Well, the First Marine Division is made up of, of all the groups that were there. It's yeah. This regiment, the Fifth Regiment, the Seventh Regiment, I don't know, all the regiments that were there make up, the Marine Division was the whole division mm -hmm. made up of several regiments and the different companies within that. And you and Tony volunteered to be in this Special yes, Forces group? Yes, we were. All right, now were you taken away from the rest of the people yes. in that area? Where did you go and how did you get there? We walked. You walked. Mm. Okay, where were you headed? Depends where the lines were and where the offenses were. The, you know, in any battle there's, uh, you know, there's movement. Sometimes the enemy attacks, sometimes we attack. Uh, and once lines are established, sometimes there's no movement at all, but there's just artillery or whatever going back and forth, but no one's, at, uh, no one's making any offensive attack or movement to uh, capture a particular hill or mountain or whatever. At this point, John, village. you were sent into combat then. Oh, yes. So you were, you had made the transition, you were in Korea, and now you were in contact with the enemy. So this was about January, this is about February. February, okay. March. Can you tell sp specifically where you were in Korea at that time? Well, some, it's, it's hard for me to name, I didn't know towns, like we didn't go through like Natick and Framingham kind of thing. Just we're up places. on the hills and the mountains and the yeah. woods and the, uh, but I know we've crossed the 38th parallel more than one time. So I'm sure at times we're ab above the 38th parallel and at times we're below it. Um, I know uh, the day I got wounded was uh, June, June 1st, uh, 1951. We're in the, uh, a reservoir area. I think it was called the Wonson Reservoir. I'm not sure of the spelling of the pronunciation, but the was it Chosan? No, no, Chosan, the Chosan Reservoir. That was, I was the group that I went over with was one of the replacements. To that happened in the winter of. 50, 51. Okay, yeah, so I left in December. River. Yeah, yeah, so the Chosen, that's when a lot of, you know, they were trapped and they were 
coming out and they had to um, face the winter. And that was way, that was way so up So you north. were at Wonsan, which is down on the east coast. Yeah, and more inland a little. Yeah. Can uh, you tell us, you said you were wounded, could you tell us about that? Yeah, uh, that was, in addition to harassing, harassing the enemy, that we did with maybe eight or nine of us. Uh, the group, I, my particular group, there was only 22 of us. But when we pulled a, a raid, we would only go with eight or nine people. And we would leave at night. And, but in addition to when we weren't doing that, if there was a big uh, jump off or attack, my unit, we would usually be the point group. Okay. Can, can you tell about going on a raid? What was that like? What is, what, uh, that, what was involved? Oh, killing people. Was this at night? No, we moved at night. And then uh, we would get, it would, we would get to where we wanted to go so that when the sun's just coming up, we would already had, we would be in position. Yeah, and this is about seven or nine of you. That's all. In, in this, uh, out of this larger group. Right. Uh, I'm, I'm sorry I missed a minute ago, but did this group had a, have a number or a name, the Special Forces Group? Not to my knowledge. Okay, uh, but it was the f uh, Special Forces Group within the 1st Marine Division. Yeah. Okay. And, and then we just wait till the right, you know, see, it, if, you, if you're a combat soldier, not everyone's a combat soldier. On the front, when I say combat, I mean, you're not like where there's a lot of fighting or action going on, but if you are, there are times when night comes and things quiet down unless you're attacking mm -hmm. or being attacked. Uh, men try to get some sleep or whatever. Well, that's what we did. We we get in a position where we there was no movement on either side, and um, we would wait until the we would see the maximum number out of the bunkers. There were no there were no buildings. We were in the we were in the mountains down there. Were, the enemy lived in bunkers and foxholes and things like that. Uh, and we would wait till we thought the maximum number were visible and easy to shoot. Mm -hmm. And we would only do it for about eight seconds. That's all the time we would have. And what did you do then? Did you leave the area? Then we would leave the area and go back. Yeah. At this time, were you aware of, of the people facing you across the line if they were Chinese or North Koreans? Could you tell? Well, we always thought they were Koreans, but we knew that they probably were mixed. Some, you know, not sure if it was a. Uh, uh, I think at the time a lot of us thought the Ori the Orientals uh, it was hard to tell them apart unless you sat down and you yeah. could. Uh, but in uniform, they all look. Similar. I, I could yes, I couldn't yeah. tell you if it was a Chinese group or. Uh, Korean group. I'm no, going to ask you a Korean. question that's that's not on the list, but because I know where you're coming from, um, what was the impression of the Marines under the leadership of Douglas MacArthur? Well, I I think they they're like ball players, and you and. And I don't want to say it's a game because life and death, the uh, human life is so important. But you, you don't like to lose, so you, you know, and you want to win. And it's, uh, I think when he was pulled or called off, mm -hmm. uh, I don't know when that happened, but I think the attitude was, uh, I think he <laughs> he wanted to go right into China, I think. It, uh, I think so. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but n n not to take away, uh, I, I think there are a lot of um, 
people that have had experience playing ball, you know, you like to win kind of thing. And mm -hmm. uh, I think that attitude was still there. Okay, let me ask yeah. you a, a kind of sideways question here. You went through Paris Island, you went through Camp Lejeune, you got on a ship. Did the military at any time in your training prepare you for the cultural differences you were going into? You were going over to the, the Orient, something that a Natick guy didn't know very much about at Didn't even know where Korea ago. was, really. Right. <laughs> how, how well prepared for you uh, w was all of this business? Well, as far as uh, combat, I think I was uh, pretty well prepared. Uh, I'm not sure I was prepared. Uh, the cultural side yeah. of it, being in the Orient, among Orientals. Yeah. Well, my, my, ex my experience, though, in Korea, John, wasn't, uh, I didn't really have much to do with the Koreans outside of they were on the other side. And mm -hmm. If they were the enemy, then I wasn't involved with their culture in the sense of, you know, their art, uh, their food, uh, their mannerisms and behavior. You just didn't have much was, time for that, did you? No. Okay. Not with my group. This is an odd question, I think, but what were your greatest challenges while you were in combat? Being smart, being alive, being scared, but that goes with the task, I guess, but uh, being, being smart, because if you're not smart, you can get killed. So you have to be quick. Uh, you, have, you have to think, you have to stay focused, uh, and, and sometimes when things, you know, when things are over, you, you think, you might, oh, wow, but I yeah. think during the process and the experience, I think if you're trained right, and uh, I think you get through it. Do you feel then, do you feel uh, that your training was good, that you're alive and well today because of your training? I think I'm alive because of the good Lord. Okay, that's that's better said. Where was Tony during all of this, or any of your other friends? Did you see them at these moments where you were in great peril? Yeah. Uh, June 1st, the day I got wounded, uh, we were all together. When I say together, we were you were in the we're, same we're action. The yeah. same group. Then. Would you mind telling us about being wounded? What happened? Yeah. Well, uh, I, for one thing, I thought I was in a safe place, but I wasn't. <laughs> now there was uh, there was some uh, there was a unit, not my particular unit, but there was someone that was sort of pinned down. Uh, so um, I asked a, a barman and another two barmen to come with me. Could you explain that's a Browning automatic rifle? Yeah, yeah. Well, they had the they had the power. Our group we didn't have automatic weapons because when we pulled raids, we were just um, we we didn't bring that kind of power. We just were killing individuals, not with automatics, but with rifle ammo, M1s. So I asked them to come with me, and they came with me for a little while, but they weren't used to, I don't think they were used to doing raids like I was, so attacking wasn't a real problem. Well, it was a problem, but it, we j I just did it. And must have been, I, I assume they were with me for about, well, I thought they were with me the whole time until, I don't know what the time escaped, but I turned around and I found I was alone. <laughs> but I kept going you, in. You got separated from I got separated. your other friends. They did not, maybe they had heavy equipment, too much ammo, they didn't stay with me. Anymore. You were not with the 50 caliber machine gun at this time? No. You were carrying a grand rifle? Yeah, and grenades and whatever. But in any case, the group that was pinned down, because that was, I was trying to say, well, let's, let's get them, some help, so 
I saw the proper angle to go, which I did, and uh, you know I uh, threw my grenades and did my thing, and next thing I know I was hitting the right hip, and I, I really, did, I never was wounded before, <laughs> so I never, I didn't even know what happened. All I know is I, I was in the grass in the prone position because I was. I didn't want to stand up right when you're moving. You stay as low as you can. And I was in the prone position, John, and I get hit in the right hip, and it picked me right off the ground, flipped me over, and it burned like hell. But I didn't know. I didn't know what happened to me at that. You know that sp split second. Yeah. Um, and I was hurting, uh, and then. I don't know the time, but uh, I think four Marines came up to me. Uh, one of them must have been a, a medic because he gave me a shot of uh, morphine. They put me in a poncho because they didn't have a thing, and they dragged me, literally. And we're being, it's a wonder we have, a, it's a wonder no one else got hurt because we were being fired at all the way down, but no one, that's why I'm saying the good Lord, when it's your time, you go, because how do you explain when someone is close to me uh, that we are, gets killed, person to your left gets killed, or behind you or in front of you, and you're still there, you say. Of course, you think this after, it's over, or, you know, when it's quiet, or well, what happened, but uh, Anyway, I got down to the bottom, and uh, I, I don't know who it was, but some officer came over and uh, you know, shook my hand and thanked me. Then I was put on uh, one of those helicopters, and I've watched MASH, and I never put two or two together. Kind of so, well, I was a MASH victim. You Did know. you go to a MASH unit? Yeah, I went there? to a MASH unit. I was put on one. <coughs> You know, the little ball helicopter, and on each side there was like a cat, looked just like a casket. And I can still, to this day, see the sky. I can still see that same sky, same color. It brought me back to a mash station and uh, took photo, whatever they did there, and they said, Well, I think we'll send you to Japan. Uh, they didn't do, you know, they took care of it, but they didn't operate or do anything. Did you go through the, was there a process of triage? Some stayed there and were worked on, but it, just, yes. it was decided you could go to Japan, that you yeah. had time to go to Japan? Yes, yeah. my, my particular wound didn't require, well, they decided not to operate. The bullet missed my spine about uh, less than a quarter of an inch. It, it developed yeah. that it was a bullet? It was lodged there. Yeah. So they decided that rather than take it out because of someone that was more life-threatening. I wasn't life-threatening. My wound was not a life-threatening. So they decided to send me to the Navy Hospital in Japan. Uh, so when they did that, uh, they flew me to Japan with others. When I got to Japan, got on a, they put us on a train, I guess. To take us to the, I ended up in the, anyway. I ended up in an army hospital. Uh. <laughs> they looked at my doctor. And said, what are you doing here? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> then they transported me again. They took care of me, but they transported me to the navy hospital. I think it was in Yokosuka, navy hospital. So I went there, and I was there about a week. They decided to leave the bullet where it was, and not remove it. So from there, I went to a little uh, Camp Atsu, just outside of Kyoto, a Marine camp, a Marine recuperating camp. So I got wounded in June. I think in July, I ended up in Camp Atsu. In July of 51, John, things got bad in Korea again. 
So they asked for volunteers to go back. So I went back. John, that's the second time you volunteered. And <laughs> so I went back to Korea, but my group was no longer in existence. Uh, June 1st, we sort of get beat up. So when I went back, I went back to my old machine gun, and I was given uh, a crew, machine gun crew. Was the bullet still in you, John? Yes, it was. Was it? And they sent you back into combat? Yes, they did. Can I ask where Tony was? Did he survive that attack? Tony got wounded. I'm not sure if he went back or not. I'm trying to think if I saw him after that. But what happened to you? Now, where, would you, where were you sent the second time? I was sent back to my W-2 yeah. FOD, my old group. And were you in Special Forces? No, that, that was no longer operating. And I stayed with them until February of 52, and then I came home. Tony DeMarco has since uh, was killed in an auto accident in Boston. Was he really? Yeah. When you were in the service, uh, did you follow the war closely? That is, when you were at, uh, say, Lejeune or over in Korea, did you put pins in maps or know where the 38th parallel was? How no. did you follow what, what was happening to you on a larger scale? Didn't. You didn't? No. Where did you One get day the news? at a time. Where did you get the news of, of the so-called progress of the war? What did you hear? Scuttlebutt, rumors? Word of mouth kind of thing. I didn't, yeah. yeah. Any newspapers, radio, anything like that? No. We didn't have any. When you came back to the States, um, were you discharged? No. Was your time up? You signed up for three years? Yeah, I came back in uh, February 52. I went back to Treasure Island. And I really you saw Treasure Island. Treasure now Island. Now I know what it looked <laughs> okay. like because going, I never saw it. But I got to Treasure Island and um, I was offered, uh, I'm not sure everybody was, but I mean, it, three, you put down three choices of where you wanted to finish your term. So um, I put down Newport Navy Base in uh, Rhode Island, and, and I got it. So I had, they gave me 30 days leave or whatever and report back after at uh, Newport. Uh, and that was, that was an experience coming home. Uh, I've never been in a, I've, I, I was never in a, on a real big boat until I went to Korea. I was never in a hel helicopter until I got wounded. I was never in a plane until, well, I guess from Korea to Japan, but I don't even remember that. Coming home from uh, Treasure Island, I wanted to come home. I wanted to get home. So I said, well, I'm going to fly home. Uh, rather than so 80 of us sort of chartered a, a plane the, the, it was called the Royal Air Coach Line. Well, my first experience in a plane was a converted World War II bomber that someone converted into a passenger plane kind of An OB-24? I think so. Yeah. Whatever. Yeah. I don't know. I, you, you probably can tell more than I could, yeah, but I'll tell you, we weren't up very long. Now, I, wasn't, I wasn't even afraid of anything. I mean, I, you know, where I had been, I just wasn't afraid. Well, I'm looking, I'm on the left side facing the engine, right? And I'm looking out, and I see all this fire coming out of one of the engines. <laughs> and a few seconds later, the pilot says, um, we have to, we'll, d don't be concerned, we're gonna, I guess they can extinguish an engine. Right. Yeah, so, but, but we have three engines and we'll be okay. So if I, I've grown up, we're having fun on the plane, all Marines on this plane. In a little while, another one catches on fire, and he says, 
we're going to have to land because he couldn't go over the rock. He, he, whatever was on the plane wouldn't make it over some mountains or something. So we had to land in Rawlings, Wyoming. Now this is like midnight. Now this is a small, it's not even a big airport. But we land and, and the whole town came out. This Rawlings, Wyoming, I can, they came out and they opened the whole town for us. I mean, this is at night, the bar rooms, the girls, everything. <laughs> the plane, they had to put us up for uh, the night while they fixed the plane. Well, we, we, had, a, we had fun that night. With a, Did you ever and, think of getting a refund on that ticket? That oh, <laughs> I don't think the company exists anymore. Well, did you get home in that well, same the, plane? The next day, no. The next day they said, well, it's going to take longer, so we'll have to put you on a train. And, and they put us on a train to Chicago, then take a plane from Chicago. So we took a train ride from Rawlings, Wyoming to Chicago, and from Chicago to New York, and from New York I think I took a bus or something home. It took me a week to get home. And I took a plane to get home that day, or, you know, yeah. within a day, and it took me a week. Can we back up just a second when you were at Treasure Island waiting for transportation? Yes. Uh, were other folks coming back through from the Pacific? Did you hear about other people that you'd gone overseas with or met along the way? No, j just that... The door closed after you got to Treasure Island, that you didn't hear any more about anybody else? No, except that uh, what we did here was, you know, the casualties and the deaths were on the high side. But, uh, yeah. And that was the experience. I don't know if you've ever been to Treasure Island, John. The, yes, the I was Chow, stationed the, there. The Chow Lines there, 26 feet, and I've never seen such a big mess all my life. Yeah. And I can still remember the signs, the uh, big signs up there. Eat, uh, take all you want, but eat all that e you, e eat all you take. Take what you want, want but, but eat, eat what you take. take. Yeah, yeah. That's what I can it was. still remember yeah. that. Can you look at a larger picture here and, and think that of all you've told me, uh, what was your most memorable experience of those years you served in the Corps? That God exists. Finding uh, some deep reserves in yourself and in your life. Okay. How about a, a character, a person, somebody of all the people you met in those years? Uh, can you think of one that uh, is outstanding in your recollection? Yeah, probably uh, uh, Lieutenant Holmes. Lieutenant Holmes, the one who ran the Special Forces yeah. outfit. Did you ever meet him again or see him again? Uh, he came to see me when I was stationed in Newport. He did? Yeah. So he survived and did very well? Well, he was lucky. He, uh, I was about two feet away from him when he got uh, creased, his bullet creased the top. His helmet must have protected him, but a half inch lower he would have been yeah. dead. Yeah. But it was high enough, but it cut, a, cut his head wide open. How did he keep in touch with you when you were so separated and you wound up in Rhode Island? Well, because he, he, he ended up in uh, the Navy base there, the air base, uh, Quonset Point, was it? Sure. Yeah. yeah. Did he really? Yeah. And he looked you up? Yeah. Well, he must have thought very yeah. highly of yeah. you. He came over. Is it possible that in well, all I of this... Well, I got the Bronze Star under... Well, he didn't write me up, but I think someone else did. But uh, Purple Heart and Bronze Star. Yeah. Is that in the Pacific Theater of Operations in Korea? Korea. You came home with quite a few medals. Yeah. Is it possible that in all of this there was a humorous experience you can think back on? Well, it's some, something, sure, I guess. Um, make it home brew sometimes. <laughs> that was the experience. <laughs> <laughs> Torpedo juice. Yes, that that's stuff. right. Yeah. 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 Where were you discharged, John? 
Oh, it's just Chad from Newport. It's from Newport, okay. Let me ask you something about uh, the, the particular war that you served in, it's different from other wars. Uh, what were your feelings about coming home? What kind of, uh, I guess, what kind of reception did you get when you came home? Yeah, I, I think the, there was no big parade, I'll tell you that. <laughs> but I think the people basically were still s somewhat patriotic mm -hmm. uh, from World War II. I don't think they lost, I, I think the feeling and the spirit was still there, John. But were you personally received well? Yes. When you came back to Natick, and yes. did people talk to you about your experiences? No, because I wouldn't talk about it. Then. Okay, they it took, understood where you'd been then. It took me about 30 years. And what were your feelings about coming home? Oh, I was glad to be home. Yeah, and now you Glad were, to be alive. Generally. You were fully discharged out of the Corps? Yes, I was. Yep. John, do you still have that bullet in you? I do not. They took okay, it out. They finally New took it out. Newport. Well, I, I, I began to have some problems if, with my right leg. Um, and the doctors decided to take it out. So they took it out in Newport. And actually, it was good because the bullet was uh, filled. You know, the outside, it looks like it's copper or something, you know, mm -hmm. that color. But the inside was filled with lead. It was solid lead in the inside. Do you have it? I still have it. As yeah, well. I thought you might. Yeah, then it's funny because when I woke up, they they had they taped it to my wrist. <laughs> you got a free a free bullet out of the war. Yeah. How important to you was serving in the military? Well, when you look back and and, and you add everything up, um, I think it's given me a great appreciation to live every moment. Well, I was gonna, the, the, the second part of that is how does it affect the rest of your life? Obviously it has. The yeah. But it, it's done more than that. Not just live every moment, moment for yourself kind of thing, but mm -hmm. see, I, I mentioned before not everyone's a combat soldier. War takes everybody's help. It's a team. I mean, like the rifle I had, someone had to make it. So everyone has a job to do kind of thing. But not everyone ends up in combat. One in eight, I think. Pardon? One in eight. Yeah, not every, it's right. So I know every moment is important because I'm still here and walking and we can talk. But I also know that helping every person enjoy the day rather than taking a life. Why not make your life more enjoyable? And maybe in doing that, you'll help me make my day more enjoyable. So and I think that's why I went into teaching. So when I got back, I, I was in a bad way, really. What, uh, what kind of, what did you teach, John? I'm, I'm sorry I didn't know you were well, a teacher. Well, you have to understand where I'm coming from. When I, my, my last year in the service was a tough year. I really had a hard time. Um, was that at Newport? Yes. I don't think I ever went back to Newport sober. From, you mean you'd go out on liberty and get... Yeah. And the only thing that, why I didn't get in trouble, uh, sometimes I, I'd be late or I wouldn't be back for a day or two, is because, you know, the Marine Corps, if, you, if you're, I get to have the Bronze Star, and that, that means a lot. I mean... I had people cover for me, and I didn't have them cover, they just did. Yeah. So I never had a problem with that, but I had a problem with myself. So when I got discharged, I was still having a problem. I couldn't even tell you today how, how, to, get where, how to get back to where I was stationed. Couldn't do that. How did but, you become a teacher, John? Well, when I got or back... Or when did you decide to become a teacher? I knew I was having a problem. Yeah. So I... So our Father Foley, who used to be here at St. Pat's, that's my parish. Mm -hmm. And he was there before I went in. I mean, he was a, a, a... So he counseled me a little bit. And uh, 
sort of straightened me out a little bit. And he says, well, why don't you take the college entrance exam to Boston College? So we worked together a little while, and I finally took the exam, and I got in. Did they, ha did they have such a thing as the GI Bill for you? I have the GI Bill. Yeah, so you got college uh, and... Yeah, I'm, I'm a disabled vet. I got, for, with my scars and a puncture, I also hurt my ear, and I have a small piece of shrapnel in my forehead here. So I got disability, and I also, the GI was still in effect, mm -hmm. so I got that. So I went to BC. Uh, my first year I almost quit because here I am four years, well it was three years in the service, but then when I got out in August, I didn't go to BC that year because I was still having problems. So I, my father, who as I told you was a construction worker. Yes. Uh, he was a laborer. Was, quad, the uh, quartermaster was being built at that time? Sure. And my father said to me, uh, gee, there's a, uh, one of the engineers is leaving to go back to teach at college, and there's an opening there. I said, I'm not an engineer. <laughs> he said, well, and my father, he spoke broken English. So I had to listen to my father, so I went up and... He was from Palermo, you better listen. Yeah, <laughs> well, uh, and Father Foley was helping me at the same time, so I went up and uh, Believe it or not, the, there was a young person that was in charge of the uh, engineering group, and he says, well, uh, are you good at math? I said, well, I took college courses in high school, but I, he says, uh, he had a transit there, and he says, well, let's see how you're doing this, so he gave me a little shot, he says, we'll do the engineering part, but if you can run a transit and take level shots, and we'll tell you what to do, you can have the job, I guess. So I worked there for, I worked there until uh, it was, you know, the job was done. Mm -hmm. And uh, then I went to, uh, actually it was one year because it was under construction when I started. I went to BC and I gradu graduated there in 58. And became a teacher. Yes, I did. Good for you. Good for you. And I was with the Natick School Department for 35 years and ended up as a, the last uh, 15, I was a principal of the Brown School in Hartford Street. It, if you look back, um, can you, from your own experience and from not even having, for the other people who weren't in service, how do you feel about if there was a great difference in public opinion as, as the way they treated veterans uh, from my war, World War II, your war, Korea, and the Vietnam War? Did yeah. you see a difference? Oh, definitely. Can you tell us about that? Yeah, because I, I remember the uh, Vietnam um, a great deal because I, I think a good part of that, I was teaching at the Elliott School when a lot of the riots and things were happening and, you know, um, the country really, as far as the majority of people, really wanted the soldiers back home, get the hell out of there. Uh, as a wounded veteran, what, what did you think of that, John? Good or bad or yeah, well, I, I sad think, or I, I think good? As a veteran, I think, I think veterans have sort of two feelings. One, I would, you know, you, you hate to, you like to win, so you have to support the veterans. But then, if you then you have to go beyond that and say this was something political, had nothing to do with the soldiers. You know, so often the soldiers pay the price of some political person that's sitting at some desk somewhere. Um, in um, so there's a political versus the mm -hmm. soldiers. The soldiers, I don't think there's one soldier that wouldn't support another soldier. Um, I don't think there's the people in this country that really wouldn't support the soldiers too. I think there was a, this was more of a political battle. And of course, who paid the price though was the soldiers. The soldiers paid the price for some political decisions that are made. And sometimes political decisions support what the, um, what the people, um, 
believe also, but when it's not that way, then you know, then there's problems. Yeah, then there's a problem. John, you've you've described to us the you come from a large family, and you have a large family. Is there one thought that you'd like on this tape to leave with them? Uh, some overall wisdom or view about what you've been through? Well, L maybe love, love each other. Love each other. Let's, let's, one final question. A hundred years from now, <laughs> I think you and I are going to be quite older, but people are going to be looking at this tape. Is there anything you have to say to them? Yeah. Well, life is so precious, and if every person could do one thing to make the world better, do it. I mean, you know, this. We're here such a short time, even if you live to be 200. You know, life is, uh, depending on what your belief is, but life is so short. Why can't people just find ways to uh, be kind to one another? Hmm. Love one another. What, what's wrong with that? I mean, I think it's, yeah, what's wrong with that? that? If I could leave a message, I guess it would be that, you know. Try to do, try to do something kind each day that would make life better for those around you. John, has yeah. any last comment you'd like to make for this tape? No, not really, except that be good. Okay. We thank you very much for participating in this program. You've contributed to history and we appreciate it. And You're welcome.